Broadcasting from the Keep Moving Forward Creator Studios, it's time for the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. This limited release show features the stories of the 2019 contestants of Dwayne The Rock Johnson's athletic competition, NBC's The Titan Games. Now here's your host, Katie Galley. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. I'm your host, Katie Galley. In the Keep Moving Forward Creator Studio with me today, I have Titan Games athlete, business development consultant at Oracle, decathlete, and aspiring professional basketball player, Montez Blair. How are you doing, Montez? I'm good. It's bright and sunny in California, so I definitely cannot complain. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Sunny weather is uh, is always the best. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and um, sharing your story with us today. Of course, anytime. So um, just to kind of get to know you a little bit, Montez, I wonder, where did you grow up and how, if at all, was your childhood shaped by athletics? Uh, I grew up in southern New Jersey, different parts between Camden, New Jersey, Sickleville, Ariel, Williamstown, Linderwald, different parts bouncing around. Um, but sports has always been a big thing, competing in anything, essentially, trying to beat my older brothers, um, trying to battle my older sisters mentally because they were always the smarter ones. Um, <laughs> but basketball started for me when I was three years old. Track started when I was in middle school. Uh, it just so happened that I was the fastest kid on the block, so it just kind of continued that way. Um, but in a, in a sense that uh, my mom was also an athlete. She competed track and field and was also a competitive cheerleader. Um, so it made sense to kind of follow after her and balance two sports. Uh, but since since I can remember, I've been competing, uh, whether it be basketball or football or track and field or some type of – I don't care if it's ping pong. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go at it. <laughs> yeah. Just having that love of sport and, you know, having it fostered by your siblings and then, too, your mom having been a track athlete and a cheerleader, then just being – growing up around it and being surrounded by it, but then you being able to develop – a passion for your own two sports with basketball and track. And so when you started to really dive into basketball and track, um, as you got older, maybe going to middle school and high school, did you have aspirations to try and compete at the collegiate level in both of those sports or did one sport kind of um, become the dominant one? Oh no, basketball was always, basketball has been my life since I was three years old. It mm -hmm. just so happened that I found out that I was much better at track um, initially my junior year of high school, but then my sophomore year of college kind of really took off and it, and it kind of became more of my identity because that's what was in the paper. Hmm. Uh, but basketball was first and foremost, my first love. There was times, I don't like telling this story, but my mom loves it. She, me and my brothers would, uh, we would make my mom make a plate at the table for our, our basketball. <laughs> 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 oh gosh. Yeah. That, that was, that was a good time, and we were not even thinking we would actually eat the food for our basketball. But it was it was a it was like a more of a symbolic thing that the the basketball was also a part of our life. So just as much as it fed us, we had to feed the rock. Um, nice. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, um, basketball was my 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 life essentially. Grew up playing AAU basketball. Um, and traveling the country, uh, going to different national tournaments. Um, in high school, middle school was, that was just the, the fun times. Uh, but by the time my sophomore year came around, it was like serious. Uh, I was, was pretty well ranked and um, got a couple of MVP awards, primetime shootout MVPs and New Jersey State MVPs was recruited highly and ultimately committed to play basketball at the Naval Academy in 2008. I played there 2009, 2010, and I loved it. I actually just got in contact with my uh, my college coach from the Naval, Naval Academy. He's now the coach for the Sixers. Wow. Um, so I don't know. We'll we'll see how that goes. I, I just want to. I'm not gonna like push that right. into like a reality, but I also won't give up on that dream. Um, but yeah, we just got back in contact, um, and he kind of helped develop me from my early stages of basketball, my first year of college, which was great. Then I ended up going to Iowa Western and I had a junior college. It was a great, great experience. I really 
really did well, made a name for myself. Um, when I got to Cornell, uh, there was a whole different switch up, and I ended up focusing on track more, and that literally just skyrocketed and took off. And then basketball took a, took a back seat to track for a little bit. Um, well, for the next six years, essentially seven years. Wow. <laughs> um, but either way, I, I'm not going to say like I want to go back and change anything. Basketball was my life, and track was a great experience. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, I mean, and it makes sense to being, um, I mean, having this passion and love for basketball and wanting that to take off, but then realizing too that track, um, you had this opportunity on the track too to see where that career could potentially go. But then knowing that taking part in a sport like track and field couldn't possibly harm you, um, harm your performance on the basketball court. It could just help you in staying in shape and developing um, developing yourself as an all-around athlete in a different way. So they kind of worked together then um, when you competed yeah. in both of the sports. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so, actually, my coach at Cornell, he's kind of like my father figure, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Coach Taylor. He's bred so many of us and, and raised us from, you know, young athletes to mature men. Um, but, yes, we actually had to do a lot of basketball workouts um, in terms of, like, for high jump, we had to run the three-point circle inside of our gym um, just to make sure that we had, like, a perfect curve. Um, we had to do repeated dunks um, with a basketball or a weighted ball yeah. um, to make sure that we had quick explosion. There was a lot of lateral drills to make sure that we were make sure, making sure all of our fast twitch muscles were activating as quickly as possible. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that correlated to basketball and actually playing basketball, I think, relates directly back to jumping, jumping because you're constantly cutting, you're constantly up and down. Um, there's, 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 there's very similar movements. And when you take off to do a layup, it's exactly the same thing that you do when you take off for high jump. Yeah. Um, so it correlates very well. Um, and it's like I would say that actually basketball is the best workout if you can stay injury free to do track if you're not actually training specifically for high junk. Wow. Um, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, so it, it kind of helped me in the sense that I love both of those sports um, and actually ended up being good at both of those sports. Um, one kind of benefited from the other and I guess I kind of thrived a little bit. Yeah. And so when you then, um, so you had this different kind of path that you took once you got to the collegiate level. And so once then you got to Cornell and you started to focus in on track, uh, track more so, and you said, you know, you wanted to see where that career could take you in basketball, um, took the back burner for a couple of years with track and field though. Um, did you see then, okay, you, you always had that desire, that dream to play uh, professional basketball, but then did a new desire develop as a track athlete too, to see if you could see where, um, where that career would ultimately take you maybe to the professional level. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually, when I graduated, uh, when I graduated college, I went pro with, uh, Adidas for about a year or two, two, almost two years. Wow. Um, and I think my junior season at Cornell was when I knew, like, all right, this is <laughs> this is going to be a real thing. I'm not going to lie. Like, when I was at the Olympic trials, I didn't even know it was the Olympic trials. I was just following whatever my coach said. If, like, if he said, do something, I did it. He was like, we got a track meet in Oregon, and it's a big meet. You'll have fun. That's all he told me. I didn't know it was one of the biggest stages in the world. I had no idea. Um, and I performed really well there, uh, ultimately. Uh, my junior season ended up making the Olympic team, um, uh, the world championship team. And, you know, we'll see, like, if from there, it was just like, we'll see if, if I can continue to do this, it would be a, a great thing. Um, and kept pushing, ultimately was getting, like, smaller offers from, like, Nike and Adidas and um, Mizuno, I think it was called, Mizuno. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I ended up going with, with Adidas because um, they were also part of like the track club that was um, part of New Jersey that I that I was like connected with. So it made it it made sense to kind of go with them. And then I ended up moving to Arizona. So that was when my professional career actually took off and I started competing at at a, an elite professional level. Uh, ultimately, my last year of pro was in 2017. Um, and I was in England. And that's when I was getting my master's. And that was probably the most fun time I had. Um, ended up getting 
two British championships, um, two, two British university championships, competed with uh, a great team. They love, love track and field out there. It's different. Like the, the way that we love American football and uh, basketball here, baseball, is the way they love track and field and European football, soccer out there. So the, the clout and the love that they create is awesome. Um, they even do things like have – long jump or high jump events. Um, everybody loves the sprinting events, but they have like long jump, high jump, pole vault events in the middle of like these massive malls or shopping centers. <laughs> the whole town comes in. It's like a, a very massive like ceremony. They bring out like wine bottles. I don't drink, but they bring out wine bottles. <laughs> Just the gesture alone is kind of like very cool to me. I've never had like an experience like that until I actually went out there and now. That, that, that in itself just kind of shows the love that they have for the sport. Um, and you know, it, was a, it was a blast. It was a great experience. But yeah, junior year was kind of when I knew um, when I went to Russia uh, with the U.S. team. That was when I knew, like, yes, this is this is it. <laughs> this is like this is the future because basketball is not not as solidified for me. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool that you. I mean, the path that you took, and um, I mean, not knowing at the time the level that track and field could take you to, but it did. And so then, I mean, having this opportunity to travel and compete and seeing these different perspectives of different countries and how they view the sport of track and field and elevate it. Um, but then too, I mean, you say your last year pro was twenty seventeen, and but then going to those Olympic trials, did you ultimately go to the Olympic Games in any given year, or did you um? Want did you qualify? I mean, what was that process I, I, like? I qualified, um, but I didn't compete. Okay. Was, I, didn't, I didn't have the standard, which sucks. So, yeah. Um, this, so a lot of people walk around and, oh, yeah, you're an Olympian, you're an Olympian. I don't really consider myself an Olympian unless I actually compete. Mm. Um, so it was, it was a different kind of tell. But, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't consider myself an Olympian. But everybody walking the world, like, look, you have the, uni- you have the uniform. You did well at trials and use it, use it as part of your brand. But mm-hmm. yeah. So with that then, so did you go to the Olympics though and just not compete or did you? Right, um, I didn't compete. You just didn't compete. Okay. And so yeah. with that, I mean, facing that struggle, then knowing that you qualified and loving this sport so much, how did you uh, navigate that? I mean, having the, you qualified and um, having this status as a as an Olympian, but then feeling, you know, you wish that you could have competed. You wish you could have actually set foot on that stage and and taken it to the next level. Um, how did you? Um, I don't know. How I did you face I, that at that time? I'm not at the time. I didn't even know what was going on. That was my first year, like in the big leagues with track and field, and I was still in college, and I was kind of just doing what my coach told me. I'm not even going to. I didn't really know what was going on when they said you know, go to this meet. I just went to the meet. Yeah. Whether it was a lot of people there, whether it was a little, a little bit of people there, I just competed the same. Um, I don't let the stage kind of dictate how I perform. Yeah. I want to just kind of go out there and give my all. But, um, yeah, I mean, the name, the names really don't mean anything. It's more so about the enjoyment, the fun that I have. Yeah. Um, it could be a local meet. It could be a, um, a national meet. It could be a USA sanctions meet it doesn't doesn't really matter to me yeah absolutely it's rising to the occasion no matter what like you're saying it doesn't matter if it's the smallest meet a dual meet or the world stage it's um just Mm -hmm. always being prepared and ready to compete um compete at that level and so from there i mean you said you were traveling and you um were pursuing your your master's degree uh correct in europe and so yes that was yeah go ahead that, that was like the time of my life. So my half brother is British. <laughs> okay. Um, and I wish that I could be European sometimes. <laughs> he he makes it seem like Europe is the greatest place in the world. I still think that America is the greatest place in the world, but we kind of <laughs> have our battles. And being out, so kind of what happened was he graduated his undergrad undergraduate degree at Loughborough, um, which is where I actually went to get my master's um he kind of convinced me he was like hey you know you should come out here just experience the culture and then from there if you love it you know we can kind of go we can kind of take the next steps i went out there immediately it was just great <laughs> <laughs> it was it was awesome um the the schooling experience the the people the culture the diversity it was just amazing i was in london too so um 
there are so many different like backgrounds and heritages, like so much to learn about different uh, people, groups of people. Um, and from a standpoint of the masters, I learned so much um, just in terms of tech in um, smaller tech companies and entrepreneurial ventures that I was able to utilize that in order to get me um, my job here, here at uh, Oracle, which was an amazing experience. I got to see many companies founded and started, and that's actually what I'm doing right now is collecting the resources to kind of start my own venture. Um, so from that master's program led to this, and that is where I'm currently seeing um, one of my avenues of, as, as a future. Hmm. And so, uh, I mean, if you if you want to talk about it, what is this venture that you see yourself going down this that you're collecting resources and learning about for um, that you want to go off, go off and do on your own? Um, so it's called ARC. It Arc? stands for Ac- Acts of Random Kindness. OK. And essentially, I want to kind of take. Take people's addiction towards social media and push it towards po- real positive action in our world, not the virtual world. So when someone gets a like or a comment on any of the social sites, there's like an endorphin scent that like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm accepted. I'm, a, I'm welcomed. And I want to take that um, and kind of combine it with a study that I had in undergraduate with my undergraduate degree at Cornell. Um, it's called normative social influences theory. So what you hear, you see your environment with That is essentially what you grow up into, what you grow up in, you kind of absorb and you become, um, and then you emulate and push that back into society. So if these things are constantly, how we learned about it in college was, you know, usually it's negative things, negative things. If you absorb these negative things, you kind of push that back into society. But at the end of the lesson, it was kind of like a a short discussion (laughs) between me and my professor about the same thing can happen with positivity. And he was like, yeah, sure. But as a majority, it usually happens with negativity. And I was like, all right, well, I want to kind of reverse engineer that. So I took that and I kind of designed a business around using four different pillars. Um, There's a challenge. There's a sort of like critique kind of show, um, an award ceremony, and then there's an app to kind of make sure that the posts are getting the recognition they should so that other people can take the challenge and continue to do it. That's the whole thing was the award ceremony was to kind of make sure that in that, that feeling of acceptedness, the show that people see their video more often and they're also willing, uh, a feeling of acceptedness um, and kind of let it explode to a point where I, I'm being loved for doing good for someone that I've never met before, someone that actually needs a helping hand. And that is kind of where I want to take it. Um, so honestly, if anybody wants to help out, I'm all hands on. I'm, I've actually just kind of solidified my team here moving forward and we could use all the help we, we can with, uh, kind of getting the word out there and getting people motivated to help other people. There's a much deeper structure, but in a sense, those four pillars kind of help out with pushing for the biggest change that I can see. Yeah. And it's really cool too, that you had that experience in school and you want to um, just understanding different components of it and trying to create something for the good of people and for the good of the masses. And so with that, then um, you said you developed your team. Um, How close are you to rolling, rolling this out or have you already, already put out a prototype? No, no. So we're, we're actually designing everything now. I have um, a a non-functioning prototype. Yeah. Not, uh, completely coded, but um, we're registering the business within the next couple of weeks, and we're making sure that everything is kind of sound on kind of like the intellectual property side before we push everything into the public. We want to do another test round and make sure everything is going forward correctly. I got gotcha. you. Well, that's that's awesome. Um, that you, you, I mean, you're just taking these steps forward, and you know, you know the next steps to take, and um, you're doing whatever it takes to to push it out there because you see you see this need, and you wanna you wanna fill that void um in the world. Right. So I just think that the best way to overcome any issue is with love and companionship. Yeah. 
So the more we can spread that into the world, I think the easier it is for us to overcome any struggle that we're going through. Um, I've noticed that it's easier to get over an issue with someone else or a group of people rather than it is to do by yourself. Mm -hmm. Some people are um, have that mental edge to kind of, you know, I can do this by myself. I want to do it by myself. It's kind of like a pride thing. I, I kind of have the same thing, but um, I've noticed that issues are better overcome when there's people around you that are willing to help. Um, and if you're willing to help someone else, it will come back to you later on down the line. I'm a firm believer of that. Um, so if I'm willing to make the sacrifice now so that other people can benefit later on down the line, I think that would be a great thing. Um, you know, if something, one of my struggles comes along, I think there was somebody willing to make the sacrifice to help me. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, with this incredible journey that you've led Montez as an athlete and now an aspiring business owner, um, how did you ultimately end up as a contestant on this season's Titan games? Um, so my, my college friend, um, Nandi Okoye, he hit me up and was like, Hey, you like the rock, right? I was like, well, yeah, you know, I like the rock. <laughs> he was like, well, you like to compete as well. I'm like, yes, I, I like, I like to compete. You know, this, this is what I do. Like, stop <laughs> asking me weird questions. <laughs> he was like, well, there's this show. And I'm like, okay. He's like, I know you don't really like the, the limelight too much, but how about, being on a competition show that the rock's hosting and i was like you don't really have to tell me anything else if the rock going to be there i'm down <laughs> and i get to comp <laughs> i get to compete against the best some of the best athletes in the world again of course absolutely no issue um so i i, I would i would love to have been on the show but the main purpose i was there was i wanted to compete against the so like the tryout um which happened i think it was sometime between like june and july um, I was actually there to kind of support him to make sure he made the show because it was like he he came in, um, he was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm like, all right, well, I know you can you can compete better when I talk a lot of trash, so I went there initially to like hype him up to make sure he was doing everything, and he started crushing it. And then I got a little bit too competitive, and I was like, all right, you're not just about to put me up. So then I started like getting really, really, really competitive <laughs> to the point where I was like low-key screaming at him like if you don't if you don't win like you can't go home like that <laughs> that's as simple as it is <laughs> so he he was actually going so fast that um he fell during one of the courses and what i mean he was moving he fell and got up without a like a blink of an eye it was that quick mm. and for him to be six seven and like 260 pounds he was moving his weight as if he was like a ballerina so I, i've never seen i've never seen anything like that um i played i played and competed with this man for years so he he gave his all and i was like, all right it's time to go it's go time and then ended up doing really well at the combine ended up making the show the result wasn't the result that i wanted uh, which is why i'm definitely going to fight to get on for next season yeah um but you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if the opportunity comes. I'm definitely going to fight for it. If the opportunity comes, I'm taking it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. And, um, like you're saying, it's rising to the challenge and having someone kind of put it out there and, uh, challenge you for it, but then you, it's just that competitive drive comes out and it's, um, I mean, it's just been fostered in you since you were young, since you were three years old and started playing basketball. It's something that's never going to go away. So you're just going to rise to the challenge no matter what. Right. Um, one thing is, I'm I'm competitive in anything, yeah. so I don't I don't it doesn't matter what it is. Um, if there's a challenge in front of me. I'm definitely going to try to overcome. And one thing about me is that I I don't like quitting. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm I that's like one thing I stand by is I I am not a quitter. Yeah. Uh, if I have to move on and try to improve my life, that's one thing. But um, if there's a a challenge in front of me, an obstacle, um, I'm going to figure out out a way to get over it, around it or break through it. I'll even dig under it if I have to, but <laughs> s some ways it's going to, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that relates back to like, if I have a challenge in my life, um, having people around to help me overcome that challenge. It's not like, I like to do things by myself sometimes, but um, it's, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. There's zero wrong for asking for a helping hand. It doesn't mean that you didn't, 
achieve the goal. It just means that you had help achieving that goal. Yep. Uh, it took me. A, it took me a while to learn that, but um, lessons come with their own time, and it's it's more of a thing where you just learn not to give up. Um, keep going and find a way. And if your way is by yourself, if your way is with another person, if your way is with a group of people, if you figure it out, you figure it out. Strategy is not just one. It's not linear. Strategy is every way that you can figure out to get the job done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Oh, that's that's awesome. Keep going and, and find a way. And so it's just and, – and like you're saying, you have to rely on people around you. Um, you said earlier, you know, it's easy to think – um, you're going after this goal or you aspire to be something and to think that you're on this journey alone, but you're not. You can rely on the community around you, the people who've supported you since you were young, doing whatever it is that you're going after and knowing that on the days that it gets hard, you can lean on them and they're going to lift you up. Exactly. I, well, you, you said it. I, I didn't want to use the word, but it takes a community. Mm-hmm. Um, some people can do it on their own, but in most cases, it takes a community. Everybody wants to have the story where I did it. I had nothing and I made something when in reality, like you don't get somewhere without the support of someone along the way. There's right. some type of support, whether it be big, small, menial to you and giant to another person, there's some type of assistance given. Um, and whether you want to give recognition to that or not, it's, it, it's there. And, and whether you want to accept it or not, it's still there. Yeah. Um, so you you said I, I I love the word that you use. I just didn't want to kind of push that on anybody. It's like community. Yeah. Your community is a base for you to stand on. It's a piece of leverage for you to propel your life, your your goals, your journey, whatever it may be. It's it's probably the biggest asset in life that people have and they don't utilize. Uh, I want to kind of push that into the world that community is. It's a, it's a, it's a positive piece. It's an ally, essentially. Yeah. Um, absolutely. To utilize it the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, Montez, with this experience that you've had now, um, specifically on the Titan games, but also drawing on, um, like you're saying this life experiences that you've had as an athlete, as now an entrepreneur pursuing different paths, um, And just specifically now with the people that you've met um, coming off of the Titan Games and having this friend push you and um, really bringing out that competitive edge in you, I wonder, what would you say is your definition of a Titan? And how do you believe that your experience on the Titan Games will now carry over into the rest of your life? Um, Honestly, I've never done any of those courses before. Those are just just to be able to say that I, I mean, I essentially I ran through a wall. Like that's that's what I did. Like, <laughs> I was wearing. I felt like a hawk. But um, to me, I would I would define a titan as the same way I would define a leader. Um, so people believe that oh, you just have this innate ability. You're born with this grand um, kind of strength. When in reality, it's something that you build over time. Leadership is not something that is. You're not born a leader you develop characteristics and instill beliefs in yourself over time. And that is what makes you a good leader. Mm. And when you take those experiences that you have and you analyze them to benefit a group rather than just yourself, that's part of leadership. Um, And that's the same way I would define a a Titan. Um, A Titan is somebody that is willing to lay down their, their body, put their body in front of, you know, mass amount of people, let them walk over so that the group has success. Um, a Titan is somebody that is on the front lines, seen as a leader, um, but on the front lines fighting any battle. It's not somebody on their high horse in the back um, telling and dictating someone um, so that the successes come their way and everybody else kind of takes the fall. That's, that's not a leader. That's not a Titan. A Titan is somebody that is for the people all the time. Mm. Um, And I mean, yeah, that would be my best definition of a Titan. Um, But it's somebody that is never going to give up on their dream, somebody that's never going to give up on the people they love. Um, And if you love all people, then fight for all people. Uh, And that's just where I stand. Yeah. 
That's great. I love that. It's someone, I love what you said. It's someone who is um, for the people all the time. And um, that's just, it's such a, a great picture because it's true. That's that's definitely who a leader is too. So a Titan is seemingly synonymous um, with being a leader. Right. Yeah. And I so, agree. Yeah. Yeah. Which is incredible. And having the opportunity to, to have this experience with 63 other individuals um, who embody those traits as you do and um, stepping up on that again, I mean, another kind of world stage um, and being able to show people um, just being for the people in the sense of being vulnerable and sharing your stories, opening up and showing that truly um, everyday people can accomplish extraordinary things if they just are willing to step up and um, and just put their put their hearts on the line like you guys did in this um, in this season. And so Montez, with um, with that and just this experience that you had as a Titan, but specifically just overall with all of these different um, journeys that you've been down and all that you've accomplished, and knowing that you still are going to accomplish all of these goals that you have coming up and these aspirations that you see as an entrepreneur and as an athlete. Um, I just have one final question that I ask all of my interviewees. What do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I want to be, I honestly, I, I get this question. Um, well, I kind of get this proposition that's pushed on me. It's like everybody sees me as the athlete and I don't want people to see me as just the athlete. I'm yeah. a, I'm a, it's just the side of me that people want to see. Um, I'm much much more than just the athlete i'm a nerd i love i love nasa i love the stars um i love my family i love you know making a difference but the one thing that i want to be remembered for overall is i want to be the one that leaves a positive stamp on the world i want to be the one to leave a legacy like some of my idols um like gandhi um, like Martin Luther King, just kind of positive action to change the world for for better. Um, now, I may not have the same vision as everybody else in, in the sense of passing positivity constantly to overcome, um, but I want to be seen as the person that is constantly driving for change um, and never giving up on their beliefs, um, constantly being that person that is trying to lend a helping hand, trying to uplift other people. Uh, I want to be the person that's constantly smiling and saying jokes. Uh, I want to be remembered as ultimately family to everybody. Um, I don't want to not leave a legacy. I don't want to ever be um, someone that was kind of not pushing for their goals and if even if I'm not to achieve what I set out to achieve, I want to be the person that's remembered for giving their all towards trying to achieve what other people say is impossible. Thank you all for tuning in to today's installment of the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. To learn more about each of these Titan athletes, be sure to check out their information in the links in my show notes. Furthermore, to stay up to date on all things coming out of the Keep Moving Forward Creator Studio, be sure to subscribe to the Keep Moving Forward Podcast iTunes channel and follow along on social media, also available in the show notes. As the creator of the Titan Games, Mr. Dwayne The Rock Johnson says, Titans aren't born, they're made. And I hope today's story helped you realize all that you are capable of becoming if you put in that hard work and just keep moving forward.